uh, we'll start uh, today's proceedings with a small prayer. I request you all to close your eyes and to remain silent. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the gift of a new day as we begin the second day of the conference. We ask that you renew our strength in mind, body, and spirit so that we can make use of the time for the best. Forgive us for the errors of the past and help us to walk more closely with you in the future. Amen. So without uh, taking much time, I request uh, Professor Eshwanta to welcome the uh, speakers of today's session. Mr. Eshwanta, over to you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome all of you to the day two of the National Conference on Challenges to Secularism in India in the 21st century. Firstly, <clears throat> I would like to welcome our patrons, uh, Father Brian Pereira, Director of St. Joseph's Evening College. I'd also like to welcome our beloved principal, Dr. Paul Newman, principal of St. Joseph's Evening College. I'd like to welcome our eminent resource persons of the day for the session one, Father Cedric Prakash SJ, who is a writer, who is a recipient of Legion of Honor by France, and who is also a peace and human rights activist from the Gujarat province the Jesuit Society. I'd like to welcome Dr. Madhavan K.S., Professor, Department of History, University of Calicut, Kerala, who deliver the lead lecture, the second lead lecture today. For the second session, I'd like to welcome the panelists for the panel discussion we will have. The moderator of the panel discussion, Dr. Paul Newman, and the panelists would be Dr. Albert Joseph Smith and Professor Ravi Richard. I'd like to welcome both of you, sir. And last but not least, I'd like to welcome all the paper presenters, all the delegates, all the students who are present here and the faculty members who are present here. I'd like to welcome each one of you. Thank you. Over to you, Mahesh, sir. Thank you, Professor Ishwanta, for welcoming the uh, speakers of today's session. And uh, I request uh, uh, Professor Chandini to take over the session from now. Thank you, Mahesh, sir. Very good morning, all of you. We, the organizing committee of the conference and the management of St. Joseph's Evening College, Bangalore, welcome you all to the final day of the two-day ICSSR-sponsored national conference on challenges to secularism in India in the 21st century. It's an honor and a privilege to be given this opportunity to welcome our distinguished guest speaker of the day, Reverend Father Cedric Prakash SJ. Father Cedric Prakash is a human rights and peace activist and the founding director of Prashan, a center for human rights, justice and peace in Ahmedabad, Gujarat. He's also a member of the Society of Jesuit of the Gujarat State and has served as the convener of the Gujarat United Nations, sorry, United Christians Forum for Human Rights. He has held several key offices. To name a few, he has been Vice President of the People's Union for Human Rights and Coordinator of the Province Office for Integral Social Development, an organization dedicated to coordinate developmental justice and peace works of the Society of Jesuit in Gujarat. 
Father Prakash has traveled extensively to several countries in Europe, America, Africa, and Asia to deliver talks and to attend key conferences, including those organized by the United Nations. And he remains at the helm of activities concerning human rights, justice, and peace. He has received several national and international awards and recognitions for his humanitarian work. In 1995, he was conferred the Kabir Puruskar by the President of India for his work in the promotion of communal harmony and peace. He's also a recipient of Legend de Honor, which is one of the highest French civilian awards. He's also a prolific writer and contributes regularly to newspapers, magazines, and journals in India and abroad. I reiterate that it is a pleasure and a once in a lifetime opportunity to have you with us, Father Prakash. Now, without further ado, I request Father Prakash to enlighten us with his thoughts on the subject of the conference. Over to you, Father. Um, thank you, Chandani. Um, the patrons of this conference and um, Father Brian Pereira and Dr. Paul Newman, um, the organizing committee, Mr. My Mahesh DK, the convener, Ms. Mary, uh, Mary Ann Pice, Yashwan Thatias, and of course, Chandani, and all others concerned. Um, I, I think you can hear me, no? Am I audible? Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Okay. Yes. Uh, it's good to be here. I know I'm addressing groups of students seated in the classrooms, um, others seated, um, the delegates and so on, of this national conference sponsored by the Indian Council of Social Science Research. It's both a joy and a privilege to be here. Besides, it is also a challenge uh, in keeping with the theme of the conference, challenges to secularism in India in the 21st century. I've, I'm already given to understand your, that you all had a very absorbing day yesterday, both with the speakers, some of the papers presented and so on. Secularism, I think um, it's a key word in the country today. It's a key word in the world today. How do we look at the idea, the notion, maybe the concept, the dynamic, the activity which we call secular or secularism? In a Western concept, secularism, we all know, is basically something in which you have no religion. It's, uh, you know, you, you're not going to the temple, to the mosque, to the church, to the synagogue and so on. Basically, uh, secularism is also a synonym for atheism or perhaps someone who's an agnostic. But it's not so, so here in India. We all know that in the debates in the Constituent Assembly, the word secularism came into, into, into the fore very much. There was a very, very, very big debate. And in the, in the proceedings in the seventh session um, on the 15th of November, 1948, Katie Shah, Professor Katie Shah moved an amendment to incorporate the word secular, federal and socialist in clause one of article one in the constitution. And he argued that though major secular constitutions of the world did not uh, specifically proclaim their secular cred uh, credentials, it was indeed a case of India as a nation was still struggling to come out of the trauma of partition, the horrendous memory of intense communal and sectarian bloodbath, and was keen to prevent such internecine violence in future. However, he devoted a major part of his speech in defending the need to incorporate the word um, socialist in our constitution. The, uh, the father of our constitutional assembly, a great visionary, was very articulate, a great lawyer, one of the most studied Indians we have had, the great Dr. Ambedkar, 
responded to this contention, responded to the amendment. He did not use the word secularism. He was taking all these three dimensions, secular, federal, socialist, you know, in terms of a composite whole. And he very, very clearly said that if we have justice, if we have equality, if we have the dignity of every single Indian citizen, we obviously have to be secular. Later on, we know what, what, what happened, and this has become a bone of contention for some segments of Indian society. That is, it was incorporated um, in 1977 with the words um, in the preamble, secular and uh, socialism. Just now, for me, there is no quarrel with what was in the original preamble, and there is no quarrel which what has been incorporated. The fact that the fathers and mothers of our constituent assembly were very clear that none of us as Indian citizens could wear religion up our sleeve. We were not about majoritarianism, that the rights and privileges of every single citizen were guaranteed from day one, in fact, from 26 November 1949, and in a couple of months later, in 19, on the 26th of January, I think if it, I would request uh, as a speaker, uh, everyone to mute themselves because the speaker gets disturbed when your um, when your speaker is on, uh, kindly mute yourself. I request. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, so in that sense. We were secular from day one because justice and equity, fraternity were incorporated in the preamble. We began it on the 26th of November 1949. And in 1950, on the 26th of January, when we became a republic, it was clear India as a nation could not wear religion up its sleeve. No religion, no religion at all. For us as Indian citizen, as I was speaking to groups in Bangalore almost till, um, till yesterday, we have only one sacred book in the country, and that is the Constitution of India. It's not the Bible, it's not the Quran, it's not the Bhagavad Gita, it's not the Guru Granth Sahib, it's not the Avesta. These belong to specific religions. And religion, in terms of practice and profession of faith, is meant to be a private matter. We are secular, and whether it is in our government office, whether it is in our, our public transport, whether it is in the starting of a, a court, a high court, as we saw in Gujarat, you know, we cannot have any religious practice, not even in the Central Vista project. We have to have only secular practices, for every single Indian citizen, public and officially. Fine, we need to respect the specificity of all religions. If there is something which is Hindu, we need to respect it. We need to respect Hindu festivals. If there is something which is um, Muslim in nature, we have to respect it. It's a Muslim celebration, we need to celebrate it. Having said this, the topic that I have been asked to focus upon is the, the title is the is emerging India secular or not? There are so many things happening today. Yesterday, after the Friday worship throughout India and in many parts of the world, Muslims came on the street protesting on the derogatory remarks made on the prophet by the official spokesperson of the government. 
I know this is a government sponsored program, but I think we need to consider, you know, certain things that are happening in the country today. What about this whole dimension of how do we denigrate? Why do we have to derogate? Why we have to demonize people belonging to another faith? Only because for the simple reason, they belong to another faith. Does the constitution of India legitimize it? Do we have the right to do so? Isn't there enough of provision in the criminal code of procedure in the CRPC to be able to deal with hate speech, to this denigration, to this demonization, to this, uh, to this divisiveness, which is so existing in India today? I think that is sufficient. And I think as secular Indians, we should not. The challenge to me as a Catholic priest is, aren't you a Catholic priest? What are you doing in a conference like this? Okay, uh, if it speaks about secular, uh, don't you go by, by the titles and so on, which have the specificity of, of, um, of a particular religion? Um, I think it is important for us to be looking at, at all this, maybe in the broad canvas. Well, yes, I'm a Catholic priest and I make no bones and I do not hide that. But the point is, I think I need to question myself and my bearings on my attitudes, on my actions, and how do I reflect my faith and reflect my faith, as I said earlier, in the one single holy book, which is mine as a citizen of India. The Constitution of India, and very especially in the preamble and all the values enshrined in it, in justice, liberty, equality, fraternity, unity, diversity, secularism, socialism, democracy, republic, whatever. It's all there, enshrined in the preamble. I think in order to look at this, um, yesterday there was this little uh, newspaper at the, at, at the Bangalore airport. Okay. Um, I, 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 I think my, uh, my full screen does not, my, my, my screen with the background, it's called um, Art Bangalore. It is a weekly from June 10 to June 16. And the lead story is a great interview given by Dr. G. Rapa Krishna. And the introduction to this article says, the world of academics is very close to G. Ramakrishnan's art. He is a retired professor from the National Degree College and has written books on the Bhagavad Gita and the Rig Veda. He's a Hindu. He's an authority on Hindu scriptures, among others. During the late 70s, as the secretary of the All India Federation of University and College Teachers, and I am here in an academic program hosted by St. Joseph Evening College in Bangalore and sponsored by the Indian Council of, of Social Science Research, okay, which is another great academic body of the country. And Ram Krishna has been part of it. He was involved in the teachers' movement pertaining to curriculum and pay, among other issues. Now at 83, he's fighting against the Karnataka Textbook Committee, which he finds dubious and sectarian. And in the uh, excellent interview he gives, he says, how can Yagna bring about analytical, analytical thinking among the students? Looks what's happening to our textbooks. Some years ago, I here together with others, we took the Gujarat government to court on our Gujarat state book textbooks, which were extremely sectarian, which demonized the minorities, and which glorified Hitler. That Hitler gave a sense of identity to the German race. And you know, the, um, the, the, um, the Jewish uh, ambassador was, was extremely. Uh, you know, Angus said it, he took it up with the Gujarat government and so on. And um, 
you know, what are we teaching our students right from the time they enter the portals of our educational institution? History, I know, has to be objective. History, I know, has to be authentic. History, I know, cannot be one sided. And there is a raging debate in our country today to say that all along that India has been teaching just one side of history. But can we go on what Dr. Uh, G. Ramakrishna says very clearly? Can we leave the textbooks? Can we leave history? to a group of experts who are authenticated and revered academics and historians. If you're talking about scientific research, can we have empirical evidence? Can we not go by myths? Can we not go by, 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 by stories which are concocted? Can we not go by public emotions and look at what is authentic in the history? Let us say the starting point for us in history in India has to be the great civilization of India, the Indus Valley civilization, that of the Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa. This predates the Vedic period by several centuries. We all know that. Why is it from class five, from the earliest when we are grooming and mentoring, can we not speak about the, the glory of the Indus Valley civilization? Is it because part of the Indus Valley civilization is also in Pakistan? Is it because we manipulate and fabricate history, saying that the starting point is the Vedic period? Um, Dr. Ramkrishnan very clearly says, uh, in order to authenticate and to, um, to have an objectivity in Indian history, in order to speak about our secular credentials, can we provide empirical data, empirical evidence in order to show that? And I think this is very important for anybody who wants to talk about secularism in India. What is it? One of the greatest historians in our country today is Dr. Romila Tappard. She has written enough on ancient Indian history with authenticated evidence. Can we revisit? her books. Can we study her? I mean, now she's not taking any sides. She's proving with data. She's uh, um, proving with incontrovertible facts that this is the reality that took, took place in ancient India. And how do we suddenly discover, you know, that, um, that uh, below um, Every mosque, every church, or whatever it is today, has been some, some temple. Don't we have already Supreme Court rulings on this? On, I mean, this is there is no contention about whether colonialism was good or bad, or whether what the colonialists did with maybe the religions they brought into India was good or bad. Just now, this is not a time to debate. There are many people who will be all rage and fury about, who will have no qualms of conscience to sending their children, you know, to study in, in um, universities in the United States and Europe. I mean, there is a lot of hypocrisy. You run with the hare and hunt with the hound. You want the people at the grassroots to be able to espouse a framework, a condition, which is going to keep them centuries behind. You bring about a national education policy, which denigrates the poor and the marginalized, which does not give them access to a total, complete, objective, authentic curriculum framework. And you send your children, your grandchildren to study abroad, just to a do of the who's who in, in, in those who control the country today, and perhaps in every state, where are their children studying today? I would like to know. Why are they um, all trying to make a beehive to some of the most prestigious universities in the United States and so on, whether it is for 
uh, professional education or whether it is for the humanities. I mean, that's irrelevant. Whether it is for the for the uh, for the, uh, um, the 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 graduate degrees or whether it is for the doctorates or for the specialized degrees. I think uh, when you're talking about secularism in India, we also need to deal with the hypocrisy that is raging in our society and also with sections of society. We cannot deal with this hypocrisy if we are not studied enough, if we do not know what is our history, as Dr. Ramakrishna says in this far-ranging interview, in a Bangalore weekly that we need to study and keep the formulation of textbooks, the design of the textbooks to men and women of academics, of repute, of histories who have, who have uh, some kind of, of integrity, some kind, kind of dedication to the idea of India, to the cause of India and not to people to es who espouse this religion or that religion of people who can be highly biased and prejudiced in their thinking. So secularism, my dear friends, starts at a very early age in what we shape the young men and women who come to the portals of our learning institutions right from the earliest years and very especially also in maybe the degree um degree colleges and in the higher um, institutes of learning in our country the second point i need to make is and i think this is very important how do we ensure that syncretic traditions syncretic cultures continue in in um, in um, in our country we have hundreds and thousands of them. And th these are traditions and cultures that really do not belong to any particular faith. Let me give you an example of Vali Gujarati here. His tomb was in a very crowded, uh, busy road in the city of Ahmedabad. And in the violence of 2002, unfortunately, people destroyed his tomb. Now, the one who went to his mazhar, to his tomb, were not only Muslims. They were Hindus. They were people from all walks of life. It is because he represented the ethos and the culture, which was the best of Gujarat, his writings, his poetry, and so on. He transcended narrow confines. Or what about a person like Mirabai, who was one of the great Krishna bucks of the country here in Gujarat, the, the amount of beautiful poetry she wrote. Or what about Ajmeri Sharif? Hundreds and thousands of people go there from all faith to prepare, uh, to pray at the tomb, you know, there in Rajasthan. What about Velankani there in Tamil Nadu and or the Mount Mary's Basilica, you know, where hundreds and thousands of, of people, not only Christians, go to these tombs, go to these shrines, go to these places to pray. I came from a school uh, from Baikala. And in that school, we had Hindus and Muslims and Parsis and Jains, some Sikhs and Jews, every single, it was a boys' school. Across the, the road, we had a girls' school and the girls were represented. Now, our school began every year on the 13th of June, you know, um, it was the feast of St. Anthony. Now, many people go to pray to St. Anthony. And our school was Antonio de Souza, started by a layperson, not a priest, but belonged to the Catholic Archdiocese of Bombay. The interesting thing is, we began the school with a mass on that day. But just before exams, every single exam, and we had three exams in a year at that time, Every single boy and girl went to pray to the statue of St. Anthony. That was interesting. It doesn't matter if you're Parsi or Hindu or Muslim or Christian. Okay, you didn't study for your exams. You studied very badly. You studied for at the last moment, but you still prayed 
to St. Anthony because someone told you if you're hopeless, if you're a hopeless cause, pray to St. Anthony. If you don't study uh, in your exam, I'm, I'm saying th these were things that were happening. In Baikla, which I came from, we had this Gloria Church in front, across the road, we had, which is still existing today, a Hindu temple in which hundreds and thousands of people pray and a Muslim mosque with a common wall. And we have had this. In Karnataka, we have been living in a syncretic tradition. We have Hindus and Muslims and Christians living together, celebrating festivals together, celebrating um, 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 whether it was Eid or Diwali or Christmas, everybody looked forward to that, um, to that festival. It was a festival which belonged to everyone. Today, how do we allow a few people to divide us in the name of religion. Here I'm talking about the secular fabric of the country in which we are divided today on seemingly unimportant issues. As a secular country, we have to speak about roti, kapra or makan, jal, jungle or jameen, with a great Jesuit who died about a year ago on the 5th of July while still in police custody, Father Stan Swami spoke about when he spoke their language. He danced their dance. He sang their song. He ate their food. He accompanied the Arivasis because they were, they were not Christians. They were not even Hindus. The vast majority of them were animists. He accompanied them in their quest for a more humane and a just society in um, for um, a better India based fully on the constitution of India. And for that, he paid his price. Why do we allow such things to happen? And I think it is important for us on a day like this and uh, to reflect on this. We are a great people. We are a diverse people. We are a people who have been um, imbued with syncretic cultures, traditions, anyone praying to anyone, people who maintain the rigors and discipline of their faith. Yes, we must do it, but who are able to transcend the narrow confines of their own religion. At the end of my presentation, I will speak at Tagore because Tagore, a man like Tagore, and we have many great people in every single state of the country who epitomized this secular tradition, this greatness, this, this syncretic fabric, this pluralistic fabric, which means so much to us in India. My third point, which is also important, is, is why do we fall track? And that is important. People are using religion. People are using um, the religious idiom in order to keep the vast majority of the people divided in the country. No one is speaking about the sanctity of the secular, the sacredness of the secular. And that is very important for us. And I think on a day like this, we need to reflect on it. We need to reflect on what I call constitutionality. Let's take these anti-conversion laws. And that is very, very important. Okay, what is taking place? There are petitions even in the Supreme Court that are challenging the constitutional validity of these so-called freedom of religion, these anti-conversion laws. And unfortunately, just last month, uh, in a back to, a back, back to measure, the uh, true an ordinance, the Karnataka government has brought, brought it out. I think this is sad. Let us say Article 25 of the Constitution gives me the freedom to preach, practice, and propagate my religion. That is clear. And of course, it speaks about subject to law and moral order and so on. That is very clear. Now, what many of us do not realize, there are sufficient provisions 
in the CRPC, in the, um, um, in the criminal code of procedure, which, uh, which um, very clearly ensures that um, this criminal code of procedure is adhered to. Why are we not uh, ensuring that? And I think it is important for us. Uh, let us see what is happening. I'm, ad I'm ad an adult. Don't I have the right to choose the religion of my choice? When the Gujarat government brought it out in 2003, my question is that till today, I believe in a particular God. And now I have stopped believing that there is any God. Who are you, the state, to tell me that I have to stop? Uh, I cannot stop believing in a particular uh, in the God that I believed in. Don't tell me that atheism is an ideology. I refuse to accept it. Atheism is as much as a religion, which rules and regulations as any other mainstream religion. And I can have a debate on that. And I can show how Marx showed the world that atheism and communism is also a religion, like any other institutionalized religion. OK, uh, and it does have rituals and practices. Um, but um, it's a matter of my conscience. And I told the then um, collector of Ahmedabad, I said, who are you to give me permission or not, whether I should change my religion and not? And the Gujarat government said, I need to seek the permission of the civil authority, which all subsequent laws have it, including the latest Karnataka ordinances, which is totally anti-constitutional. Can I not as an adult, a free thinking adult, if I can change my political parties at whims and fancies and be bribed with crows, crows of rupees and be taken to a resort on the eve of elections because I do not have the spine to be able to stand up for um, for my particular ideology or the party I prescribe to, why do I not have a right as a citizen of India to be able to change my religion? Who are you, the, the state, to dictate these things to me? And I would like to know. You tell me, as an adult. For that matter, I asked several young uh, men and women whom I met during this past fortnight in Bangalore. If you're an adult, and especially if you're a woman, why should others decide whether you have the right or do not have the right, the freedom or do not have the freedom to marry the person of your own choice? Unfortunately, even Catholic bishops have fallen into a trap of what they call very derogatively love jihad. Why can't I, as a young adult woman, marry the man of my choice or for that matter, Mary has a man, the woman, or perhaps another gender of my choice. You know, who is the state to dictate to me? I may have religious prescriptions. That's another. OK, but but if I'm adult, I can say that I have a right. So basically, when we are talking about um, this, this uh, my, my, my third point is that today we have the state prescribing giving us legislation which is interfering in our secular fabric, in our rights and responsibilities, in our freedoms to be able to live up to those articles guaranteed in the constitution. And for that matter, that is article 19. It is with the same streak. We have had a great journalist like Gauri Lankesh murdered here in Bangalore where most of you come from, I think this is non-negotiable. Okay, it cannot be allowed in a secular country. She has, she has taken a stand. She wrote in the Canada papers. She wrote excellent op-eds. And there are many other people like Gulbargi, um, Kalaburgi and Pansari and, and the others who were killed. They were rationalists. But they took a stand for what was wrong how people were destroying the secular fabric of the country. 
don't we have possibilities of debating? Don't we have possibilities of dialogue? Don't we have possibilities of challenging uh, each other? Do we have to denigrate? Do we have to bring policies? Do we have to kill? Do we have to send the ED of those who stand up for truth and justice in the country and those who preserve, want to preserve the secular fabric of the country? It's a point of reflection. Perhaps there are no ready-made answers. I'm very clear about my, my conviction. I'm very clear about my stand. But can we not debate on it? Can we not dialogue on it? What about part three of the Constitution of India? What does the Constitution of India stay? It speaks about rights. Yes, I know, it speaks about duties. The duty is also to respect the rights that are enshrined in the Constitution to every single citizen. Uh, why do we have to denigrate? Why do we have to use religion even when we formulate government policies and have backdoor events of destroying the environment? Look at what is happening in, in global warming. India has come last out of 180 countries in the latest environmental index that has come. And many people are challenging it to say, how can India stand last? Of course, India is standing last. Why did we have to auction these colliery blocks uh, when there was no debate in parliament? Why do we still have to use fossil fuel? In a city like Bangalore, out of the 412 water bodies that were existing some time ago, why do we say that we have only 12 water bodies today? Uh, what about the excellent environmental groups that we have, have in the country who are challenging what the rich, what perhaps the Western interest in connivance with the, the mafia and the political lobby are doing to destroy the, the country, lock, stock and barrel. Why are we not making environmental concerns the most important? Why are we not making roti, kapda or makan, jal, jungle or jameen, you know, our greatest concerns, uh, you know, the right to food, the growing gap between the rich and the poor in every single global index from 2014, India is falling, whether it's freedom of the press, whether it is in the environmental index, whether it is in access to justice, whether it is in what is happening to the children of our country, we are reaching, we are becoming worse than the worst countries of the world. So what are we talking about? Why do we live in lies? Why do we live in myths? And why do we not say that secularism is our birthright? Secularism is, is what we are born with. We will live secularism. Don't play with religion. Focus on the develop, development agenda of the country and promise us as duly elected members, um, uh, elected members, whether it is in the state or whether it is in parliament, to ensure that we are given our due as citizens of the country. The final point before I wind up, and I would like to have some questions after that, is in terms of, um, you know, about emerging India. And that I think is important for us to reflect on. I've spoken about what is happening, how uh, India is, is in many, in, particularly in the officialdom, is using and abusing religion in order to denigrate. We hardly prescribe and proscribe to a fabric which is secular, which is pluralistic, which is diverse, and that is our birthright. The final point which I want to make today is that we are in an academic session. We are at a great session organized by St. Joseph's Evening College, Autonomous, the Department of History, and sponsored by the Indian Council of Social Science Research. And there are several academics students, scholars, researchers, I know human rights defenders, and I know this will be seen and watched by many others, not only during the day, but in the days to come, because they couldn't partake in this discussion. 
I'm saying, what is our role and responsibility? Because I cannot speak about, uh, um, about emerging India if I do not speak about my role, my responsibility as a citizen of India. For that, I need um, to put forth to this August assembly and to also to the organizers, three key dimensions which we need to address. First of all, scholarship. We lack scholarship in India today, whether you would like to agree with me or not. Okay, scholarship, which is authentic, which is objective, which is studied, which is dialogued, which is debated, which, which, is, uh, um, which is lacking today. And this is what, as I said earlier, okay, um, um, what the learned professor G. Ramakrishna is talking about. He says the veil of secrecy shrouds textbook in the state. Why should there be a veil of secrecy? Why can't we have openness? Why can't we have debate? Just now, not saying who's right and who's wrong. But for scholarship, we need, as I said earlier, we need to have study, we need to do research, we need to have dialogue. Uh, what happened to Kuwempu? Yeah, the way he was de de denigrated. He's one of the most sacred icons of, of Karnataka state. Okay. Uh, you don't denigrate a person like him, um, but but it has been uh, it is it is being done. So can we have scholarship? Scholarship has a wide ranging, and we lack scholarship in the country today. Okay, we have excellent scholars. We have people, individuals. We have institutions who have uh, who have done landmark. Our best scholars are there in the United States, and we we take glorification. For any slight connection um, with India, somebody who has migrated and an American citizen, uh, we take credit for what they are doing in the United States. That is the pettiness and the lowliness we have reached. So scholarship, I, I said, entails many dimensions. First is serious research, study, reading. There is a big survey that has come out of how Asians and particularly Indians read very little. Okay, we read what the film stars are doing. We read about scandals. We read about violence. We uh, we are in the WhatsApp university. Um, we are on social media and so on. I, I'm not denigrating any of these things, but can there be serious reading? We have a great Bangalorean, a top lawyer, the president of the P PUCL, who has come out with an excellent book. On, on the current emergency situation in India, Arvind Narayan. He is there with, the, with several groups in Bangalore and he was the founding member of the Alternative Law Forum. Okay. There are people who write, can we read, can we study, can we challenge, can we dialogue, can we debate? I think that, uh, that I, I'm not saying that I'm right or you're right, but for scholarship, we need these dimensions that need to take place in academic uh, circles, in scholarship circles, which are secure, which create the environment for study, for learning, and also for change. Can I accept another point of view? Can I? We cannot get into this with emotion, but we have to get into this with with a certain amount of objectivity. That is the first. The second is writing. One thing is, is uh, scholarship, doing a PhD thesis, studying for an exam, okay? But then how do we enter what we call mainstream media? And here I'm talking about the print media. I'm talking less maybe about the electronic media. I think which we have reached a pitiable stage, very specular, uh, especially in the vernacular. Can we write op-eds? Can we write uh, letters to the editor on what is I call the secular framework uh, of the country? We are intelligent people. We are mature people. We know what's happening in the country today. We need greater writing. Write in English, write in. No one can force any language 
on anyone in the country, but can you write in Kannada? Can you write in the language you come from, maybe Tamil or Malayalam? I know there are, there are people who belong to the other states in this country. Um, you know, can you write in any of the vernacular languages and uh, write in English, though English uh, is read by very, very few people, at least in our country. I think the articulation of our thoughts is very important, even in a small letter to the editor. And I think we need more and more people. And the third and final point, which I would like to make in this particular segment is to be visible and vocal. You cannot in today's India be hiding in your comfort zone. You cannot say, I am frightened. I know many people are frightened. Many people say, yes, we agree with you, but I am frightened. What will happen to my family? What will happen to my children? What will happen to my career, my future? Unless people stand up and speak out in defense of the secular fabric of the country, nothing will change. Please remember the denigration of the prophet very clearly is for those of us who have been talking of it about it from day one in our human rights defense is a very clear uh, laid out strategies. It is a catch 22 situation. Damned if I do, damned if I don't. It's like yesterday, hundreds and thousands of our Muslim sisters and brothers were protesting after their Friday prayer. And of course, there it was, there it was. See, I'm pointing out to them. Uh, they have become aggressive and uh, it's a, it's a well-laid of trap. Okay. And people cannot help, but fall into the trap, whether it is the hijab controversy or whatever you use, you abuse religion and you set out a well trade, uh, laid out trap. So it is up to secular society. It is up to men and women of goodwill. It is up to those who value the secular credentials of our country to set the agenda, to say that we are not able to take nonsense. We have the constitution of India, we have a great preamble, and we have to focus on, on, um, on the unity, the diversity, sabke saath we are speaking about, but let it be an actualization in the country. I want to end my dear sisters and brothers, my dear, dear learned women and men who have been listening to me. Uh, one of the contentions I was getting when I shared it with some of my friends, why are there no women, you know, speakers? So for the organizers, I hope you have more women um, speakers for your next and uh, next presentation. But I want to end with the words of Rabindranath Tagore. I love Tagore. And I love his Gitanjali. Read it, study it, internalize it, actualize it. And in that beautiful prayer, he speaks about, you know, you cannot find God in a temple. Leave that temple, leave that singing, a ringing of bells and the chanting, and you will find your God in the tiller who's toiling your field, in the farmers fighting against the three anti-farm laws. Tao very clearly says. But one of his most beautiful prayers is that where the mind is without fear and the held is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depths of truth, where the tireless striving of arms struggles towards perfection into that heaven of freedom. My father, my mother, let my dear sisters and brothers, let every single citizen of India awake. Thank you for giving me the honor and privilege of being with you this morning, of speaking to you. Thank you, St. Joseph Evening College. You know, your patrons, the principal, the, the, pre the president, the vice president, 
um, the Indian Council of Social Science Research, and all of all those who have given me the opportunity of speaking at, at this great two-day seminar, Challenges to Secularism in India in the 21st Century. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very thought-provoking and moving lecture, Father. You actually connected a lot of contemporary issues, plus took us to the nostalgia when we had syncretical values and practices in our school days. They exist today, but I think the divides and fractures, as you pointed out, are becoming more and more uh, prominent in the mainstream media fueling an agenda which is set by those who set traps, very aptly said. There are a lot of observations and questions in the chat box, Father. Uh, I would read them out one yeah. by one. Yeah, please read, uh, please read them out and maybe I'll take them combined rather than, you know. Sure. So the first observation is by Mr. Sudhakara. He says, along with constitution, Bhagavad Gita, Bible, Quran are also sacred books. Will you agree or no, sir? Uh, definitely. I've said I'm a student of the Bhagavad Gita. I've studied it. I'm a student of the Quran and so on. But please remember, we also have the Avesta, the Guru Granth Sahib. We have the sacred books of the Buddhists and so on. Why don't we have an excellent course? on world religions or the, uh, the mainstream. Look at the teachings of Lord Mahavir, of compassion, of non-violence, ahimsa, of, uh, of Satyagraha, which Gandhi adopted in fighting the British colonialists. I agree, but these are specific to religions. Can we not start for our schools and maybe for uh, the university an excellent course on, on, on religious teachings? Okay, can we take out the best from every religious teaching and have a group of religious teachers who can and have equal weightage to the Buddhists, to the Jains, to the Sikhs, to the Jews? You know, um, the, the Torah, the Jewish Torah has excellent teachings. Um, um, can we have all those? Because uh, these are specific to a particular religion. I'm talking about citizenship. And as a citizen of India, I have one, only one sacred book. And let's not, um, uh, not have two opinions about that. And that is my constitution. There is nothing else sacred for me as much as my constitution. And the, uh, my constitution encompasses the best which is said in every single religion. Thank you, Father. The next question is by Ms. Nidhi Katti. She says, Romila Thapar is a Marxist historian and has analyzed history only from that perspective. How can her writings be democratic and secular? I, I'm sorry. I, I, I wish my friend Romila was here. She would laugh if you call her a Marxist. Okay. Uh, uh, her history is with authentic empirical evidence is, there, is irrelevant whether she believes in the existence of any God or not, but he challenge her on a, scholar, on a scholarship. Uh, for me, I will not challenge her on her Hinduism or if she was a Muslim or if she was a Christian or whether she's a Marxist or not. For me, that is irrelevant. Challenge her on a scholarship, okay? Uh, refute that irrefutable evidence she gives with empirical data on ancient Indian history, okay, which people are trying to fudge, clear, clear, people are trying to do it. Do that. Do that in a debate. Do that with another book that you're writing, okay? Uh, and just not go by hearsay and not go by rumors and myths because we are living in a world in an India of half truths, of fakeisms, of people who really are not able to see. Asatoma Sadgamaya, Jyotima. Uh, the, the truth from the untruth, the darkness um, um, uh, uh, from the light. Okay. Um, we are not able to sift this. 
and take a stand for truth, for light, for justice. Okay, we get into myths. We get uh, Joseph Goebbels did it at the time of Hitler. Tell a lie a thousand times, and people will tend to believe it. And that is wrong in India. Okay, he was in uh, Hitler's information minister, and today we are living in bodified media, laptop media. Those who stand for objectivity and truth, like Gauri Lankesh, are killed. I think we have to address that. Speak about, have debate, have dialogue. Let's produce another book which proves Ramila Thapar wrong. I challenge any historian with impeccable cred credentials that she has to write another book proving her wrong. Thank you very much for your response, Father. The next question is by Veena P. She asks, what are your thoughts uh, on quoting caste and religion compulsory in school admissions and giving facilities accordingly? Um, yeah. So, so for me, there are two things in this. Okay. Um, if I had my say, if I had my say, I would not. Okay. Say, subscribe to the use or the nomenclatures, both of caste and religion. But we have to accept, okay? And this is what are the founding fathers of a constant assembly. There are people in India who have been kept as a disadvantaged position, people who have belonged to certain segments of society, have kept down them down at a dehumanized level. I challenge anyone to pro prove me wrong. Here in Gujarat, there are people who are Dalits who cannot take water out from particular wells even today. And that's a fact. In ordinary chai, chai galas, or tea stalls, okay, there are separate sources from which a Dalit has to drink tea. And that is happening in our rural areas. And we have caste atrocities that is taking place. You have to accept it, though every police station in India will say there is nothing such as caste in my police station when they file their report. We are living in a lie. We are living in a highly discriminatory society in which the fathers of our constituent assembly and successive government over the years felt that the tribals, the, the scheduled tribes, and the scheduled caste have to be given certain advantage. There are also something like minority rights. Um, institutions governed by minorities which need to give certain preferences to people from the minority community. Because I can see here in government jobs, how Muslims and Christians will not get a job in Gujarat, very rarely, okay? They will find some lacunae in the technicality of the admission form. You know? so, so, yeah. so then because of the name, because the fact that maybe the caste or the, or the religion is put, that becomes even a disadvantage in getting maybe um, the competence is not taken uh, taken place. Though occasionally we'll speak very highly of um, of a rickshaw puller's daughter winning a, a uh, Miss India contest or coming out top in the IAS. These are exceptions rather than the rule. But uh, the the national education policy which has now been being mainstreamed in the country, keeps the disadvantaged groups at a greater disadvantage. And that we need to address. So there is a real issue. And I don't have hard and fast responses to the question. I don't have black and white risk facts. But, but the fact is, the scheduled caste, those who belong to the Dalit community, are still at a very disadvantaged position in the country without access. A lot who belong to a very disadvantaged. When there is a greater sense of equity, when there's a greater sense of justice, when we have been able to mainstream that secular fabric, then I will be the first one to say, let caste go, let religion go. But, till, but today, I think we have to accept a reality and we have to try to address, um, we have to accept the reality and try to address it in every possible way. 
Thank you so much, Father, for your response. Uh, there are so many questions. I do not know if we have time to take all yeah, of them, uh, but yeah, but there's uh, one question uh, by uh, a young uh, one. Has the host, you have to decide and you have to be very selective of what you want to choose. But tell me. Right. So you, since you pointed out we have no women speakers, I thought it's important that we take up question by a young girl. She yes. says, as continuous target towards a particular religion, be it namaz, hizab, azan, prophet, and many more issues, is shifting our country to a very horrible phase where people start hating each other. As being a girl from the same community, how I can make myself patient and motivated that one day everything will be fine? Uh, see, I'm here because I have great hope in the Indian Council for, uh, for Social Science Research as being a very objective body who will take a stand for the future of India. I have great hope for an autonomous institution like St. Joseph's Evening College, all those were associated for it. We have to have hope. And my hope is about, about we will win, we will triumph. Satya Meva Jayati, that is a national, the truth shall triumph. It's not easy being a member of the minority community today. And I just now vibe with this young woman who's asking me the question. I've met several, several people, uh, both in Karnataka and in different parts of India in the last few months from the minority community. Some of my very close friends are from the minority community here in Ahmedabad and elsewhere. And I know what is happening. And I really do not have, again, a very say black and white answer. And as a priest, I should not be preaching, okay? But I have to be saying this, maintain calm, maintain restraint is not easy because when people come out on the streets as was in yesterday's after Friday prayers, there can be one person who may belonging, belong to the other side, who comes with a skull cap and maybe with a little beard and all cameras are focused on him, who starts throwing pelting stones. We have, we, we, we have it ha happened. They have, uh, 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 they have caught people from the other side uh, looking like Muslims, throwing beef into temples. They have been caught. And uh, so it's only one provocation for mobocracy to take place. And when mobocracy takes place, everything is lost. The fingers are pointed. Uh, the, uh, whether this, now, for example, there are Supreme Court rulings about the decibels about the loudspeaker. Can we not have a debate on whether uh, Navratri in Gujarat, I can go on the whole night till three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning, blasting everybody? Or I'm sitting in a school now, just outside is a marriage party plot. And in school hours, there is loud singing and dancing and firecrackers, which defeats every decibel level. I think whether we are Hindus or Christians or Muslims or Jains or Sikhs or Parsis, we have to be respectful to the decibel level. We have to be respectful to law and order. Can we not take it on our part? I mean, I was quite amused when in Mangalore, I was told that some priests were just now do not want to ring the bells in the morning at 5.30 because the Supreme Court said six o'clock. No, the bells of church uh, do not disturb people even at 5.30. Now, come on, let's be not be overcautious and let's not try to play games uh, with those who are trying to demonize some other community. I think that is wrong. If you're ringing the bells at 5.30, provided it is within the decibel level, let's continue ringing. We should know our rights too. We should not fall into the trap. But these are well laid out traps. The hijab controversy. For years, girls have been wearing hijab as part of the uniform. By Sunday, just before the UP elections, it needs to come out into the forefront in Karnataka. It's, it, these are well, uh, well planned. It is, it is a strategy to polarize. It is majoritarianism. Let's look at it. But I think we have to create synergies 
with people from the majority community. So if you belong to the minority community, who are your friends? Can you cry, create greater friends from the majority community? Can you talk to them? At the same time, it's also the responsibility of the majority community to see the traps and the strategies, manipulative strategies that are being planned in order to defocus us, in order to manipulate us from thinking and from acting, from doing what is paramount for the people of India, for every single citizen. Thank you for asking the question. It's not easy. It's a tough question. I vibe with you and I'm with you in solidarity. Do not be aggressive. Do not be violent because that is a trap to prove what they are trying to say. But assert your rights as a constitution, as a citizen of India. Thank you so much, Father. Uh, we would take up a last question. There are several, we are still receiving the questions, but I think due to paucity of time, we'll have to wind up with this one last question by Mr. Ashish. He asks, uh, why is it that even the educated people fail to understand the point that different religions are under the constitution of India? How can such literate people be made to understand this relevant point? We all know roti, kapda, makan are essential, but the government is not actively working for these issues, including the environmental issue, not talking about solutions pertaining to global warming. This is his observation. Yeah, my dear friend, just because you have a degree, just because you have passed exams, even by, with 100%, that doesn't mean to say you're an educated person. Education is about culture, it's about dignity, it's about respect for the other. If you're unable to do it, whatever money you have, whatever degrees you have, I still will uh, say that you are an uneducated person. The point is, education is not about scholarship in India any longer. Why do we have all these tuition classes mushrooming? Okay. You go to Delhi, like Mukherjee Nagar, we have hundreds and thousands. I mean, um, I, I cannot help by saying I'm fairly a senior citizen, but and it's, 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 it's obnoxious to be saying when I, I was young and uh, when I was your age and so on. But it's a fact. Only a dull student went to a tuition class. You know, why do we have the racket? That means the schools are not teaching, uh, are not educating. But what is education? It is education is about the all-round development of a child, of a human being, of a woman, of a man. It is, as we say in our Jesuit education, making women and men for others. And we have an ignition paradigm of education. I think um, uh, a, um, having a degree, getting a good job, and so on, does not make us educated, but scholarship, holistic education. And I think it is, it is, it is um, um, the responsibility of every single institution, like St. Joseph's Evening College Autonomous and the, and the chain of institutions belonging to the Bangalore Jesuit Educational Society, which is headed by Father Brian uh, Pereira, to be able to ensure that the education we are providing in our institution is not only book education. I've been with young students um, you know, of the higher classes, and they were complaining about traffic jam. They were complaining about pollution. I asked them, how many of you have more than one car, two cars in the family? And the vast majority of the students put up their hands. They don't realize that they are the cause of global warming, climate change. They don't realize of the pollution, of the traffic jam. I said, how many, how many of you come by bicycles? Four or five in one class put up their hand and everyone started clapping. And I said, yes, these are the heroes of today. Can we not encourage our children and our people? Netherlands did it. Everybody, okay? Um, a, um, a friend of mine was a former Luxembourg, uh, um, Prime, Minister of, um, a Prime Minister of Luxembourg, and he was going to parliament um, um, on a cycle. And uh, he had no problem in doing it. He lived a very simple, uh, frugal life. There were no traffic jams created by our babus 
trying to get from one yesterday when i was going to the airport i was told if any minister goes in this particular road maybe we are jammed for half an hour and that's a fact uh, can we reinvent what our studies are about what education is about can we get to the root idea of education of educare can we create women and men for others can we help them look at the constitution of india to have a holistic education and all drawn education that means definitely it means it it definitely means sports it definitely means song and dance it definitely means also the respect for the other can we encourage them to have friendships in every single institution of ours which transcends the narrow confines of caste or creed or religion only then my dear friend we can call ourselves educated in this country of india until such time we need to work towards a more secular diverse pluralistic fabric for our country and for that it is the responsibility of every single one of us to be visible and vocal to stick our necks out being in our comfort zone will not change things thank you once again father for that provocative and enlightening session i think all of us are really beginning to reflect on our roles and responsibilities as the citizen of this country first thank you once again father for taking out time to speak with us today welcome good i would now like to invite the next speaker for the session on behalf of the organizing committee and the management of st joseph's evening college i would like to invite the next speaker for the session dr k s madhavan very good morning sir can you hear us yes good morning thank you dr madhavan yeah yeah yes thank you thank you very much so dr k s madhavan is a professor of history in the university of calicut kerala he specializes in pre modern kerala history medieval south indian history human geography caste and social stratification he has held positions in several key committees and boards he was a member of the expert committee for social sciences textbook of standard 12th of the state councils of education research and training government of kerala he has also been an executive member of the kerala history congress and has been a member of indian history congress may i please request the uh, participants to mute themselves since your request request you all to me mute your mics thank you dr madhavan has published papers in various renowned national and international journals and has also co-edited a volume on explorations in south indian history besides being a well known academician and intellectual dr madhavan has also been at the forefront of writing about issues concerning dalits and other marginalized communities in the country it's a pleasure to welcome dr madhavan on behalf of the organizing committee and the management of st joseph's evening college i now invite dr madhavan to deliver his talk um hello all of you good morning it is audible to you okay i um uh, thank you for inviting me uh to participate uh, this uh, two day seminar or workshop uh, this is indeed a good uh, opportunity for me to interact with the people uh which is actually this uh, organized by st joseph of college evening and uh, in the outset of this lecture i would like to extend my sincere thanks and regard to 
uh, the organizers of the seminar, the patrons, and also uh, Professor Paul Newman, the principal of the college and the faculty members of the Department of History. <clears throat> Uh, what is my in my mind is to reflect upon uh, uh, the problems and the contemporary challenges to the secular fabric of the uh, Indian subcontinent. Uh, this is on which you know for two days uh, we have been dis discussing on the issues uh, uh, in terms of the challenges to the secularism in the 20th century India. So uh, what I would like to reflect upon uh in my talk is uh, is a kind of a uh, a historical travelogue uh, uh, on the process of the cultural uh, you know uh, uh, you know the diversity and uh, 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 the cultural synthesis of the subcontinent that had been developed across centuries and which is a process through which actually the india as a uh, you know country as well as the people of India as a modern democratic uh, you know, citizens uh, who have been developed into the 20th century, in which we also find the emergence of a nation state with its own constitutional values and democratic and secular principles. And uh, towards the uh, end of the uh, you know, 20th century and also the beginning of the 21st century, what we find or experience a particular kind of uh, you know social cultural or political transformation in which uh, we are undergoing certain challenges to the secular edifice of the nation state as well so for convenient uh, uh, i would like to uh, uh, to reflect upon four phases uh, in my lecture that is in the pre colonial you know uh, social relations and cultural legacy of what we called as the, uh, the the life world of the people of the Indian people across the subcontinent. The second is the process through which the idea of uh, uh, the social solidarity the, or the idea of Swaraj or uh, inclusive idea of uh, uh, secularism had been imagined uh, as part of the anti-colonial nationalist struggle. And what was the situation that uh, that we witnessed, or we are uh, uh, we were able to develop a secular, inclusive uh, nation state in the post-independent period, and what is the conditionality that we are undergoing during the contemporary present? This is the way in which that I would like to reflect upon this uh, issue in my lecture. Now, all of you uh, well about uh, the notions of India as uh, as a culture. As a, uh, as a country or a nation or uh, a, a subcontinent having a different kind of socio-cultural peculiarities in which uh, the discipline of history actually produced a variety of histories of the, the historical past of India in which the state formation and the social formation process were got, got much importance uh, in its uh, historical writing culture about India. So normally we are come across the diversity uh, in life activities and linguistic and cultural, you know, uh, uh, diversity particularly. Cultural diversity, the mosaic nature of the, the Indian society and also the polyphonic kind of uh, uh, human interactive process have been very much attested in historiography as well. So anyway, uh, being a subcontinent, and its own historical past, the linguistic, cultural, religious, and social diversities were, in fact, that actually defined India over a long period of time. So the long cultural legacy uh, had been created primarily because of the interactive and uh, assimilative process in which the transformation of culture due to the uh, you know, interaction of the people uh, not only from the different uh, uh, part of India, but also from different continents, which actually contributed an integrative process, which in fact, uh, a synthesized form of the culture or cultural practices had been created as part of this process. So a symbiotic human relations had been developed over a period of time. This is in fact, what we find uh, uh, the historical practices of the subcontinent of India. 
so at the same time we also find different kind of political you know dominance of political systems from the time of the uh, you know what we call the gangetic region where we where there witnessed the emergence of state system uh, uh, and also a number of uh, state systems were also that came to be constituted empire like uh, you know very elaborate kind of political structures with its own parameters and uh, other kind of uh, institutional mechanisms along with we find also a kind of a social formation process in which the uh, political economy had been expanded on account of a, a social stratification process leading to the social uh, you know oppression exploitation social exclusion and also the integrative process of the political economy which in fact created a kind of uh, what we call the political economy uh, you know characterized by a certain social relations which we uh, you know uh, historians as well as common people you know do not this is a kind of a varna jadi society and it's a you know hierarchical practices so this uh, social formation process in fact actually mediated through number of uh, uh, cultural social and institutional structures along with uh, from this century onwards we also find the emergence of number of uh, religious uh, sects or religious practices largely we call it the faith forms uh, including the brahmanic and non brahmanic and or uh, you know other forms of uh, local you know uh, practices or faith forms or cultural practices so this had been sometimes an integrative process some, some sometimes this uh, religious articulation and faith forms or uh, ritual and uh, you know uh, uh, other forms of uh, you know express, expression especially the material culture which actually defined uh, the indian culture uh, over a long period of time uh, this uh, what we find on one hand uh, what we find a systemic kind of institutional structure which had been mediated by a varnajadi society on the one hand and so also we find the emergence of number of state and its institutional mechanism there is a circularity of uh, both this process uh, in fact legitimized by uh, many a number of ideologies in which religion for example the brahmanical religion which provided a kind of legi legitimation process for uh, a hegemonic kind of state system as, a, as well as social relations of power this is uh, uh uh but at the same time we find a number of opposing uh, you know faith forms to the overarching or hegemonic practices the brahmanical social relations of power and its hegemonic ideologies that resulted in the form of uh, non brahmanic or uh, you know heterodox religious practices in india in the form of buddhism jainism and other kind of uh, heterodox religions which also defined and contributed much towards the uh, what we call the uh, uh, the multiplicity uh, and to the polyphonic nature of the indian culture so the historical legacy of all these processes of the state formation society economic culture and religious practices and faith forms actually defined uh, the indian culture uh, its material as well as spiritual culture in multiple ways so which indicate that at no period of time in the history of india there was a hegemonic religion i mean hegemonic or monolithic religion as such even the brahmanic religions were there uh, what we witnessed is it was highly you know opposing sometimes it was uh, uh, there were you know multiple kind of uh, practices within the brahmanic tradition itself when buddhism or jainism or any other any other practices were also uh you know witness this this multiplicity and plurality of religious practices in the subcontinent so what i am trying to argue that what we call as religion in the medieval or ancient or medieval or late medieval uh, period what was the nature of which uh, uh, which was in fact as a, a polyphonic multiple diverse kind of articulation of ritual forms and religious activities even in the didactic literature and faith forms over in literature and canonical kind of literature related to religions were highly polyphonic opposing sometimes so this is the legacy and uh, 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 the, the historicity of what we call the faith forms religious practices and ritual culture of india 
or Indian subcontinent at large. At the same time, we also find a social relations of power in which certain social groups of social class who could emerge and could dominate the society and who provided an, uh, the ideology for legitimizing the state power in which you know social stratification and social exclusions were largely developed which resulted uh, in the marginalization of a large number of people including the working class or the peasants the marginal peasants the untouchable communities largely the uh, the forest dwellers and other kind of people who engaged directly in the labor process for the production of material resources were largely marginalized and, sub and subjugated and exploited and they were socially culturally economically uh, were excluded from the main stream of society and who had been subjugated because of the dominant kind of religious and ritual practices sometimes and at the same uh, what is the what is the conditionality of this process uh, uh, in the beginning of the uh, you know 19th century when we find or witness the the dominance of the british power largely as a colonial experience which is subjugated the subcontinent at large and under the british uh, you know uh, uh, dominance or british uh, colonial dominance what happened is that there is an endeavor to recover the India's historical past as part of uh, the discovering of India's legacy, cultural history, religion, rituality, and uh, literature and language, etc. And et so the Oriental colonial administrative scholars who wanted to discover the India's past, predominantly focusing on the largely the dominant uh, literature, Sanskritic, more largely, Sanskritic literature were discovered. Uh, for Vedic, the Hasa Purana, the Dharma Shastri literature were discovered, and they were uh, translated into European languages and thus were introduced to the Western world, which uh, actually, which in fact uh, uh, made a process in which the Indian scholars of the elite origin were actually, uh, were in fact, get in touch with this, uh, uh, this uh, translated, uh, you know, or translated published you know indian knowledge system uh, of uh, largely the sanskritic origin and this is also the practice through which you know the europeans were able to get in touch with the indian religion spirituality practices culture history etc so the mediation that had been made by the british or western scholars in the case of the uh, uh, what we call the, the invention of the Indian tradition or uh, what we call the the discovery of the india's historical past largely through the literary traditions or uh, linguistic uh, you know imagination in the form of uh, faith forms or literature didactic literature mostly sanskrit literature were in fact actually provided new kind of understanding about the indian past including the religion in which the brahmanical religion uh, which was largely you know predicated in the form of uh, textual traditions, the hegemonic textual tradition got attention, which was popularized as India's religion. That is what is happening. At the same time, the plurality of the religious practices and the multiplicity and diversity of India's religious practices or faith forms uh, had not been given much attention. Rather, the textual tradition of the religious practices were given much importance in the administrative scholars for ontological discoveries of India's past. So this is in fact a actually leading to uh, a renaissance, what we call as a renaissance in many parts of the world, because this religious, ritual, historical, you know, uh, literary texts were, uh, became very prima facie, a kind of a reference point. Uh, along with the new ideas that was introduced by the Western world through the colonial administrative scholars, and through the uh, British administrative, uh, you know, engagements or uh, what we called the uh, the colonial uh, writing culture, which also provided a pivotal role in the case of uh, what we call the Indian Renaissance of the elite, uh, uh, you know, orientation. At the same time, there were you know struggles and there were attempts and there were uh, you know uh, efforts from the part of the lower strata of society the different part of India, especially in the Western India and South India, which actually, uh, uh, you know, formulated certain ideas and they 
uh, you know, wanted to uh, recast a society on the basis of equality, the notions of equality and justice. And also these, uh, uh, the, the, the renaissance of social reform process that was largely started from the lower strata or the, at the bottom of the society, uh, they were able to imagine the society in terms of notions of equality, uh, notions of the democracy, equality, uh, what we called uh, uh, social justice at large. So this is a process in which the India's historical past had been contested by within the uh, within the, uh, the I mean uh, the political imagination of India during the uh, modern times so during the time of the British colonial period, which also actually uh, made certain contestation uh, regarding the religious uh, understanding of uh, different group of people in India itself. For example, the anti caste movements, the anti Brahmin movement, or the largely the social reform movement predicated on the notion of social equality and also the uh, egalitarian democracy wanted to question the Brahminical dominance in terms of religion or in terms of culture or in terms of knowledge tradition. At the same time, there is also a contestation and negotiation from the part of the lower strata of society during the time of the reform movement, which also produced a number of critical engagements to the India's historical past as well as the religious traditions. So this process in a way actually leading to a next process uh, that is a political uh, process of the independent movement within which also there is a contestations and negotiations uh, regarding the religious articulation of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the people as well as a religious understanding of the religion itself. No? Uh, for example, the early nationalist leaders actually wanted to argue that India had uh, as, uh, India had a, uh, a great traditions or a great civilization, which was uh, characterized by a spiritual tradition of uh, uh, the Orient. So the spiritual India was the imagination actually put forward by the, some of the nationalist, uh, you know, scholars and nationalist figures in the early part of the national movement, which is also followed by uh, the early uh, reform movements or Renaissance movement. Okay. And uh, this idea was, in fact, actually given by some of the Western romantic, uh, uh, you know, Indological or Orientalists, Indologists and Orientalists. So they actually, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, Indologist induced understanding of India's past by the nationalists, some of the nationalists who actually wanted to uh, say that uh, the, the, mod the Hinduism is a, you know, highly uh, dominant or a kind of a monolithic religion itself and spiritual monolithic religion itself. No? But in fact, when we think about the historical process of the subcontinent, we can say that there was no as such, there, there was no Hindu uh, as a religion, but what existed were there uh, was a kind of uh, a Brahminical ritual practices having its own legal, ritual, cultural practices and textual traditions. And majority of the people were, in fact, actually never become part of uh, the, this Brahminic religion. And they were either treated as untouchables or lower caste, predominantly because of the caste uh, and uh, the practice of uh, social exclusion practices, either in the form of uh, untouchability or in the form of other type of uh, social exclusionary practices. So what actually happened in the modern period, even in the period of the social reform or in the period of the national movement thereafter, uh, what the Brahmin, uh, I mean, as a social class uh, or Trivarnigas as a social group and their ritual practices, their hegemonic traditions, their religious practices were treated as or they were given as a, a homogenic, uh, a monolithic and homogenic kind of Hindu religion as such. This is, uh, in fact, a, a kind of uh, a new discovery of religion, of a majoritarian religion in India. So, because almost all other, uh, you know, group who were not treated as Hindus or who were largely treated as uh, either as untouchables or the Shudras or other socially excluded people uh, were, you know, somehow do 
through through the colonial uh, you know uh, representation or administrative practices to census and other kind of things or historical writing culture and other other kind of negotiatory systems this uh, large number of the non brahmin people a large number of untouchables and other marginalized sections of people their identities were largely in terms of caste for the caste of a person historical experience were somehow through the mechanism of uh, through the larger discursive practices of uh, colonial writing culture and colonial classificatory mechanism were largely integrated to the hindu religion so what i am trying to say that the modern uh, the majoritarian hindu idea was a colonial mediated or colonially constructed kind of identity that is my point and during the national even then the case was so uh what actually happened during the national movement it was an inclusive uh, idea national movement was an inclusive kind of you know movement uh, which incorporated every uh you know every part and every regions and every people and culture uh, within the fold of the anti colonial national movement primarily because of the anti colonial sentiment which had been developed as an anti anti colonial nationalism even though there are many theories regarding the nationalism so anyway it is a it is an invention of the past or invention of tradition or it does an imaginative community of uh, linguistic or religious whatever maybe the, the community uh, maybe the the idea of nationalism what what the peculiarity and historical historical specificity of the indian national movement is that it is a multiple at the same time a, a kind of an inclusive kind of idea that is the niche the inclusiveness was uh, in terms of uh, human identity in terms of uh, religious and re religious or uh, ritual practices or identity of locality and region or people and culture or in language the idea of anti colonial national movement was an inclusive idea of swaraj where this inclusiveness was in had been incorporated with the due respect or due recognition within the national movement that was one important idea so that is why we called the swaraj as an idea was an inclusive idea at the same time we also find the other process that is what is the indigenous or indian or indic idea of some of the medieval for example the idea of the the poet saints same poets the ideas of buddhism or jainism or uh, the sufi ideas or christian uh, missionary ideas of uh, you know uh, solidarity patriarchy love etc and so the humanism were largely integrated into the process of the making of the nation or the making of the national idea of uh, nationalism okay so what we find the idea of karuna for example the idea of maitri the idea of samada and the idea of anugamba these are uh, these ideas were largely developed in the medieval times either as a religious or ritual practices or as a practice of the protest traditions or as a practice of anti caste movement or as a practice an ideology of the social equality of the downtrodden people the notions of karuna or maitri samada and anugamba were integrated to the larger process of the making or developing of an anti colonial nationalist sentiments was important feature so what uh, the idea of india was defined as a modern uh, you know uh, uh, nation uh, which was in fact historically produced the notions of equality the notion of fraternity the notions of uh, equality fraternity which in fact 
actually resulted in the making of a new kind of two ideas. One is the egalitarian notions of the egalitarian democracy. Gandhi, Ambedkar, you know, Nehru, and a number of you know national leaders of the national movement who invariably contributed the notion of the radical equality. Gandhi wanted to say that the equality was an inclusive idea. Ambedkar uh, actually put forward the idea of the radical equality, and Nehru was uh, 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 was in favor of uh, a, an inclusive idea of equality. Uh, you know, uh, incorporating the notions of socialism and other things, in which at the same time, both Gandhi and Nehru or Ambedkar actually they their shared notions, their ideas about the inclusiveness were largely defined by the notion of uh, what we call a secular. A secular. Secular is a different kind of idea for India, especially in the time of the national movement. Not even though it was a derivative idea from the European past, especially the European Renaissance and uh, European, uh, 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 European historical experience of the liberal democracy or the liberal democratic idea and state system. But when we use it as a practice, as a practice along with the process of the national movement, this idea of secularism was redefined in accordance with the historical legacy as well as then contemporary present of the national movement. So this idea of secularism was in fact in Indian tradition, especially in the national movement, was an inclusive idea, incorporating and synthesizing, and also a kind of a transformative, assimilative idea, having a symbiotic relations uh, in which the recognition and uh, reverence, recognition or uh, 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 acknowledgement of uh, identities of people, acknowledgement of the historical specificity and locality of the people was important for this, uh, this symbiotic, I mean, symbiotic understanding of secularism in India. That is a point that I would like to make. And, uh, and what actually happened uh, during the time of the national movement is that the national movement was a you know, very complex process. Uh, there is also a tendency within the national movement, many a tendency, because there is there were the secular, there were the socialist, there were the highly right wing, there are the radical movements of uh, anti-colonial as well as the anti-caste movements and movements for social equality, movement for uh, anti-colonial uh, movement, along with the movement for social justice and equality, anti-caste movements. So these complex movements were in fact actually formulated the idea of an inclusive nationalism, you know, in which the secular credential was important for the existence or development and existence of the political democracy. You know, the political democracy is important for all these national people, uh, leaders of the national movement. The political democracy must be a representative democracy. The, the representative democracy, that means it, must be, it, it should represent the people having different or multiple identities, either in terms of religious identity or minorities or linguistic identity or identity having a regional particularities within the subcontinent. So the political idea uh, about the freedom or Swaraj and uh, the nation that would be carved out after the independence must be a nation based on inclusive democracy or inclusive political democracy having the parliamentary or parliamentary kind of a democratic process in which the idea of secularism was important. Without secularism, there is no possibility for the sustenance and continuity of the political democracy. That was the notion that had been invariably developed by the almost all leaders of the national. At the same time, there was also a tendency there was also a tendency to, to, to view the Indian past on a, on a, a supremacist, majoritarian uh, religious ideas. There was uh, a tendency uh, towards the uh, second half of the uh, you know, 20th, 20th century. The, the then right wing uh, uh, you know, people wanted to carve out the Indian past or interpreted in Indian past exclusively on religious, majoritarian religious terms, which in fact actually culminated the idea of the Hindutva supremacist idea 
or the Hindutva nation state in subsequent times. So uh, at the same time, there is an inclusive, what I called as an inclusive nation state, uh, 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 inclusive nation state with the notions of a representative democracy, representative democracy in the sense that you share of the, uh, uh, the particular and respective people must be given in the sharing of the political power within the framework of democratic, uh, secular democratic framework. That is uh, uh, the trajectory of which was very different. Uh, 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 the people who wanted for that kind of a representative democracy uh, wanted to, to, to say that the representative democracy must be an egalitarian democracy. An egalitarian democracy in which almost all people having the down, you know, downtrodden origin or social ex the experience of social exclusion must be represented their due share in political power uh that they actually it was it was they they who actually formulated the idea of social democracy on the one hand and uh, what we call the social uh, uh justice on the other so the social justice movements which was in fact a movement for social democracy a movement for social equality, a movement for equality on the basis of fraternity and social democracy, largely within the framework of what we called an inclusive secularism. An inclusive secularism was the idea that was spearheaded by the anti caste movement or egalitarian movement for uh, uh, making of the Indian nations. Uh, 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 because of the structural inequality existed in the subcontinent, and also the structural exclusion that existed in the subcontinent, any idea of secular or any idea of secular political uh, you know, uh, power or political idea must incorporate the notions of inclusive democracy uh, based on social justice. That was the notion. So the notion of the social justice and, and, uh, you know, and representative uh, you know, political power must be based on the basis of secular idea of the political power, you no know? secular idea of the political power. That is the notion. So, so when we uh, got independence, what was the plight of the conditionalities of this kind of an inclusive democracy and secularism is that quite different. Because we uh, came to be constituted as a democratic nation, a state having a Republican constitution, and the notions of uh, uh, Republican people and Republican idea, a democratic and secular idea, uh, are founded on or are founded on a planned development and the welfare nationalism or welfare state was a peculiar feature of the new independent India. For the post independence period witnessed this kind of a predicament for an inclusive development. Uh, on the basis of social justice and inclusive democracy, or what we called the planned development for a welfare nation state. So the welfareism or welfare activism of the nation state newly formed, given by or dictated by the constitutional uh, you know, principles of secularism, and along with the what we call the scientific spirit or scientific temper in every walk of life. Uh, uh, with the idea of an equal citizenship or equal opportunity, equality and equal opportunity. Uh, the constitution actually visualized a nation uh, incorporating uh, every part and every parcel of the cultural legacy of India's past, as well as the long tradition of anti-colonial struggles, at the national movement, the idea of secularism, idea of democracy, idea of anti-caste movement, idea of social justice, etc. Which had been incorporated into the into the uh, into the uh, I mean the national document that is the Constitution of India. What where we find the Constitution of India is uh, the notion of equality. I have already pointed out the importance of the radical demo, radical equality. Uh, you know, radical equality defined by Ambedkar and Nehru. You know? Radical equality is an equality which was uh, defined by social justice and inclusive democracy, as well as uh, the due representation of the participation of the almost all, all work of the people, including largely 
the marginalized section of the people. So the radical equality was defined in the constitution in terms of equality before law and the equality of opportunities. Equality of opportunities. And also the justice was also defined in terms or in tune with the notions of secularism, that is the justice, social, political, and economic justice. So there is no democracy, there is no secularism without justice. So justice is a very important idea in the constitution because India never witnessed a historical transformation on the basis of uh, the idea of justice. Even though there are religion or there are ethical moral practices, there are ideas, uh, there are uh, you know philosophical traditions about the justice or equality but in 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 terms of actual historical practice in the form of state power or in the form of for in terms of culture we don't have a, an idea of equality and justice as such it is because of the establishment of the constitution or it is because of the emergence of the indian nation the modern democratic nations that we experience nationally the equality and justice an experience of everyday life, largely in terms of a national practices guaranteed by the constitutions. So what the idea is that of the secularism is defined or uh, somehow there is an intersectionality, what, what I call as an intersectionality of the secularism, which is reflecting upon the notions of the equality and justice. No? You know, justice for the large number of people, including the women, the minorities, the large number of the people having the identity of the ex and ex untouchable historical past or untouchable historical past. The equality for them is a predicate, predicate you, you know, national, you know, guarantee of the constitution. And so the equality is defined in terms of largely an inclusive idea. An inclusive idea in, in which uh, the everyday human experiences or human life activities must be guided or must be predicated on the basis of equality and in which human practices, every practices either in terms of everyday communication of everyday experience must be a secular kind of experience, must be a secular kind of experience without the prejudice of either in terms of gender, religion, caste, and community. Okay. So the idea of democracy is largely defined in secular understanding is that of the democracy is a kind of worldview. Democracy is a kind of life world. Democracy is a kind of what we call a human life experience. Because it is, according to Ambedkar, democracy, secular democracy, what I call it is a secular democracy, is idea that is a, a life itself, you know, it's a way of life. Democracy, according to Ambedkar, so secular democracy is a world view, a kind of life practices, a kind of idea of life itself. Uh, according to him, it is a uh, it is a cultivated. It must be a cultivated idea or cultivated sentiments, or uh, uh, it is an inclusive idea because it is a reverence and respect towards the fellow man reverence and respect towards the fellow men. It is an everyday practice. But in fact, in every walk of life, uh, our everyday life is guided by consciously, unconsciously, directly or indirectly in terms of notions of gender predicament or predicament of the social discriminatory structures, which was historically constituted and defined and designated, either in terms of number of notions of caste and community identities. So the secularism in Indian uh, Indian, uh, Indian practices or Indian everydayness is a kind of uh, anti-discriminatory notion. Secularism is an idea. It must be an anti-discriminatory notion. It must be guided. The secularism is an idea. It must be guided by uh, the idea of an inclusive uh, democracy, uh, or it must be guided by the idea of uh, social justice. There is no social justice, a notion of social justice within the purview of secularism. The secularism must be uh, an idea of an exclusionary process. So an inclusiveness was inevitable for the inevitable condition for the practice of secularism. Secularism is 
not mere a religious coordination or religious you know uh, uh, coordination it must be an idea of integrating uh, the people in terms of a symbiotic relation of brother brotherhood or solidarity so the social equality and social justice must be the cardinal principle of what we call the uh, uh, secular or secular democracy so secular democracy and its inclusiveness is an inevitable kind of the political necessity in the contemporary india so the challenge to this uh, notion of uh, uh, the inclusive secularistic idea as i have already told you that is the idea of the majoritarianism the idea of majoritarianism you know uh, 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 one of the lectures in ambedkar in the constituent assembly he rightly point out the notion that the majority the idea of majority the you know, democracy in, in terms of majoritarian democracy or uh, uh, the parliamentary democracy is arithmetically defined in terms of the majority okay but ac according to ambedkar democracy as a way of life democracy as a culture or secular democracy as an inevitable uh, you know foundational notions of political democracy he argues in terms that uh, the majority should not be a communal majority the majority should not be a communal majority see the uh, from the 1947 from the post independent what is the predicament of the post independent period that is seven decades of the post independent experience as a, as a largest democracy in india or democratic uh, uh, you know uh, life of the uh, indian political system that we are somehow able to put forward the idea of uh, you know collective parliamentary democratic process towards the future uh, by or within the the larger premise of the constitutional framework okay? framework but what actually that the, the, the that the political majority was in fact was not a communal majority in india but now what we witness there is a transformation from the political majority uh, that political majority actually recognize and acknowledge the existence and the right of the minority either religious linguistic or uh, 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 or uh, uh, minority identities varieties of minority identities the minorities are recognized and acknowledged within the parliamentary democracy or majority i mean the majority uh, majorityness of the democratic process within the uh, seven uh, you know 70 years of uh, our political experience of nation state through largely largely through the parliamentary process but this this is actually happening uh, what is actually happening is a, there's a there's a transition from this parliamentary process or political democratic process to a a political a politics a what we called as a, a, a democracy of a, a communal majority a democracy of the communal majority uh, that communal majority is an idea based on a, a, a majority religious supremacist ideology a majority religious uh, supremacist ideology in fact this majority idea of a communal supremacist ideology was in fact the idea of the minority idea of a minority not the linguistic and cultural minority but minority as a social class minority as a social class a social class comprised of largely the interest group having the uh, identity of elite uh, elite historical past or elite identity who actually formulate the idea of uh, majoritarianism or uh, or religious minority as a communal majority so this communal majority actually doesn't represent the majority people of india either in terms of religion or in terms of culture or in terms of religion uh, but what actually this is a constructed imaginative or constructed uh, uh, idea of majoritarianism of a minority of a, a particular vested interest social class uh so what is the point is that this idea of majoritarian supremacist idea uh, which wanted to carve out 
replacing the democratic nation state, the constitutional morality, the constitutional principles, the parliamentary de democracy, and they wanted to establish a theocratic state of religious uh, orientation, religious orientation, or a, 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 a in which the citizenship uh, must be a contested terrain for not only for the minorities, but also for uh, you know, a large number of uh, what we socially marginalized social class or groups or communities. That is the point. So what I'm trying to point out that the idea of citizenship as well as the idea of uh, 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 idea of uh, 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 the inclusive uh, 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 inclusiveness, the idea of inclusive democracy, idea of secularism is uh, is in fact uh, uh, replacing with the notions of uh, cultural nationalism, notions of the cultural nationalism. Uh, so, uh, what is the the inclusiveness of minorities became a became a question. Inclusiveness of minorities that is the inclusive minorities. Uh, so, the idea of secularism is an inclusive idea in which the minority status has been recognized, has been uh, uh, constitutionally validated and constitutionally acknowledged. That has a, a contested. Uh, question nowadays, primarily because of this majoritarian communal idea of uh, majoritarianism. So the communalism is a different kind of idea in terms of its articulation and its, in terms of its, uh, you know, historical origin. Primarily because of the reason that this communalism was in. Uh, see, even though there is a dichotomical, uh, you know, definition of communalism, the minority communism and uh, majoritarian communism, sorry, communalism. The communalism was in fact a kind of historical experience which was uh, largely spearheaded and selectively up, you know, applied or se selectively articulated in violent forms of anti-minority you know, riots in different parts of it, uh, the subcontinent, largely different part of India, which has a particular kind of trajectory uh, uh, to nullify or to marginalize certain you know, minority communities, uh, which in fact actually uh, leading to a politics of uh, social exclusion in which the minority communities are being, uh, uh, you know, somehow uh, live uh, in a condition of the ghettoization in some areas or in condition of a perpetual threat. That is the conditionality of the communal majoritarian idea and practice. So uh, what is the uh, predicament of this process in the contemporary period is that the so democratic nation state is actually uh, you know, transforming to a centralized majoritarian uh, religious uh, uh, oriented state. And along with the process of the ghettoization of the federal democratic principles, federal democratic principles. So the exclusion of uh, marginalized groups including the minorities, was a conditionalities of this process in which the appropriation of the secular and democratic legacies the, of the nation state, as well as the anti-colonial struggles, largely in the historical past, had been uh, or have been reappropriated in order to, to legitimize the majoritarian ideas. For that purpose, a selective appropriation of the historical past and culture and the legacies of historical past had been actually, you know, how been uh, taking place. So one of the important issues is the question of the mythification of the historical past and also the contemporary present. The mythification of the historical past and contemporary present is uh, inculcating in tune with the majoritarian supremacist ideas. So the ideas against the parliamentary democracy, uh, ideas uh, against the inclusive democracy or equal citizenship or welfare nation state, or the recognizing idea against recognizing the minority culture or minority status or the culture, legacy, the life activities, life hold uh, of the minorities, either linguistic or cultural or regional minorities. 
are being in a in a in a in a state of flux or critical flux. Uh, uh, that is the problem. So I would like to conclude the, the the lecture by pointing out the importance of the constitutional morality, or the morality of the constitution in which we find the idea of the modern secular democratic nation state. And also there is a idea of uh, majoritarian communal uh, idea, communal, you know, political supremacist political idea. Uh, this idea is actually founded on the notions of the social morality. So for 70 years of India's political experience as a nation state or constitutional uh, nation state, what the nation you know, uh, has been you know, guided by the notion of the constitutional mor morality, the con morality of the constitution, which is characterized by the inclusive democracy, the idea of secularism or uh, democratic secularism, idea of the socialist notions, the idea of scientific spirit, scientific spirit and scientific temper. And on the other hand, what, what is being put forward or what is being you know projected as nationalism especially the cultural nationalism is the idea of the social morality of an ancient or medieval past so the medieval brahmanic idea of social exclusion or medieval brahmanic idea of social stratification or medieval uh, Brahmanic idea of social exclusion, either in terms of gender and caste and other kind of discriminatory practices were recovered or reimagined in terms of cultural nationalism. And these ideas were actually put forward against the constitutional morality, the secular nation state of India. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your patience and uh, I also extend my sincere thanks to the organizers, especially the patrons and Makesh, uh, uh, the faculty of the Department of History and other members of the faculty and uh, uh, my, uh, my friend, uh, the principal of the college, Professor Paul Newman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Madhavan, for that very informative lecture dealing with various perspectives on the notions of secularism. You started your lecture by tracing the indological or the textual view of the Indian society, characterized largely by a Brahmanical understanding of the Indian society and making us realize how we have later come to an evolved understanding of the inclusive secularism, which is now being challenged by uh, the mythification of the glorious past. Uh, I suppose our audience would have their observations and questions on the basis of your talk. I request the participants to leave their questions in the chat box or raise their hand if they want to personally ask their questions. So Dr. Madhavan, while uh, our participants are typing their questions, I have a question. Can I please ask? Oh, why not? You can. Thank you so much. So uh, we recently had CAA. Citizens Amendment Act yeah. uh, being passed. Where do you locate CAA and anti-CAA protests in these contesting notions of secularism? Yeah, uh, I have already told you that the 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 idea of secularism is an inclusive idea, inclusiveness in the sense that not mere as a European. Uh, you know, derivative, uh, not as a, de, you know, uh, derivative notion, uh, because our notion of secularism was inclusive, which is in fact, historically and culturally modulated and developed. The experience of an anti-colonial struggle, for example, 
and even before that even medieval times or ancient times uh, i have already told you that the notions of uh, you know kairuna peti uh, and other things especially the uh, idea of uh, uh, the maitri samada anugamba all these the indian idioms indian idioms of uh, inclusiveness uh, karuna is an idea which is largely shared by almost all really indian religion or religions of uh, indian origin or the practicing indian religion uh, uh, they actually uh, variously you know uh, differently articulated their notions of maitri and anugamba anugamba is basically a buddhist uh, kind of an idea which was largely shared by many other religious or non religious uh, uh, experience of the people so this uh, this historical uh, you know incorporation of these ideas into a, uh, an inclusive secular idea was important so uh, uh, and or the indian take the case uh, uh, or the the, the 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 experience of the indian people uh, even in larger uh, historical experience either as a religious group or caste group or community group or uh, a group or people having a gender specific gender identities women and men for example so this indicate that uh, the historical trajectory of uh, identification of people within the uh, larger cultural terrain of the indian people was a kind of uh, uh, symbiotic and transformative kind of identity and there is a shared notions uh, 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 shared notions in the subcontinental culture you know this inclusiveness is a subcontinental phenomenon as far as india is concerned or india's cultural or historical legacy is concerned in largely the south asian people actually shared many you know reciprocalities in their everyday life in the historical period as well so that indicate that uh, the uh, the equality in you know as a notion as well as uh, the equality in terms of everyday experience uh, must be predicated uh, on the basis of recognizing the identities as well as the individuality of the people identity identity of uh, either as a identity of a particular sect a religious sect or cultural sect or minority sect identity that must be recognized and acknowledged at the same time uh, the individuality uh, of a people of, of of a of a group or individuality of a single citizen must be recognized uh, with the constitutional principle of equality you know equality so the equality is not mere a notional idea equality is a practicing idea you know equality must be a practicing idea so what is the ensuring principles of the equality is the the notions of the citizenship you know citizenship our notion of citizenship is the notion of an inclusive idea so an inclusiveness in citizenship recognizing the people uh, and respecting the individual uh, either as a notional uh, you know understanding or as uh, a vivid idea of constitutional morality or constitutional citizenship you know constitutionally defined citizenship Uh, which is nothing to do with religion or nothing to do with the culture any derogatory or any discriminatory practices or id or discriminative uh, divisions could not be possible or, uh, or, or 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 cannot be visualized in terms of the constitutional notions of equality or equal citizenship citizenship is an equal, equal notion of equality notion of justice notion of democracy is also very much the very much embedded in the notions of embedded uh, in the very notion of uh, uh, you know citizenship in india so uh, rejecting the citizenship or uh, devaluating the citizenship either in terms of any culture religious or identity notion is basically uh, anti constitutional anti constitutional notion and the constitutional notion and it is antithetical to the constitutional morality uh, and it is because of this inclusiveness idea of equal citizenship in india that was uh, because there were protests there were resentment there were you know difference of opinion the about the proposed idea of ca uh, and uh, Uh, other kind of uh, things associated with the uh, uh, redefinition, so-called 
assumably or alleged uh, redefinition of uh, uh, the notion of citizenship in India. That is about it. Okay, thank you. Hello. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Madhavan. I do not see any questions or observations in the chat box. I feel some, uh, thank you, uh, it is in time for scholars with this, uh, our religious perfect idea of universal birth of sister would look at respect. Yeah, definitely, uh, Prashant Kumar uh, has uh, commended that uh, the idea of an inclusive religious notion of universal brotherhood. Yeah, universal brother, brother, brotherhood uh, is love, care, respect are basically a notional category, a foundational category of almost all religion. Uh, especially uh, 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 the religion, uh, Christian religion or Islamic religion, Islam and Christian Buddhism. Uh, such religions actually, uh, it is a global religion, you know, so globality of this religious idea was in fact the universal notion of the brotherhood, which in fact actually founded the notion of the brotherhood or the solidarity or the love and pity or respect towards other fellow men or other people. But basically the, the foundation idea of almost all these religions, which is no doubt about that. So what we need to integrate or need to assimilate is the idea of the universal brotherhood and uh, the idea of mutual respect and the reciprocality of what we call the humanism uh, is, uh, is very important nowadays. Uh, let me know what about uh, Karen, Dr. Karen, he's, uh, he's saying how do we bring about the pluralistic syllabus, especially in general English subject, Bangalore University textbook have eight chapters for one semester, only one gender, only one gender or racial discrimination of nine. So what is important is that we have it to inculcate the idea of, uh, uh, you know, social solidarity. The idea of social solidarity and social justice, and also the gender justice, gender and social justice, uh, and the idea of uh, constitution and constitutional morality and the inclusive uh, secularism must be included in syllabus, even from the time of the, I mean, even from, uh, you know, high school classes must be uh, incorporated because uh, the pedagogical practices must uh, uh, you know reflect upon the constitution the legacy of the uh, uh, or historical the historicity of the nation state and the legacy of the historical past of india having an inclusive idea of culture or inclusive legacy of the india's historical past in which uh, the multiplicity and plurality and also the uh, what we call the poly, what we call the polyphonic culture of India must be uh, included in the syllabi is very important one uh, for us. But what is actually happening is a, a selective appropriation of the history and historical past and culture and legacy is taking place with a Chauvinistic idea of uh, supremacist majority and idea. That is the situation that we are witnessing even in syllabus or even in uh, educational, you know, education policies. That is a, a very, a very, very, you know, uh, important point. So we have to take into account. So individually and collectively, we can do many things uh, in propagating the idea of inclusiveness, idea of social justice, idea of equality and other things. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin, okay. Uh, that is about all these things. And thank you very much for uh, sharing me with your ideas. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Madhavan, for taking time to address us this afternoon. We are truly grateful to you for sharing your thoughts on the subject of the conference, Secularism in India, the challenges in 21st century. Yeah, I hope that uh, I, uh, um, uh, to a great extent, uh, I do justice to the topic in my lecture. Okay. I think you have left us with a lot of reflections, Dr. Madhavan. Okay. Both you and Father Prakash, uh, 
who addressed the gathering in the morning. Both okay. of you have okay. left us with a lot of reflections to think about, to ponder on, and to work okay. on towards implementing this idea of secularism. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Can I just now? Sure, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I thank all the participants who have been actively participating in the sessions.